Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Keith Silva in for Fran Stoddard. Say the name Edgar Allan Poe and somehow the air gets a little heavier, the room a little darker. Poe has been dead for 170 years and yet his stories and poems live on. Dismissed in his day as a hack or worse, a one-hit wonder, Poe's work continues to inspire, to be celebrated, and yes, to haunt. So much of Poe's work takes place in interiors, locked rooms, private studies, and inside the mind of Poe's put-upon protagonists. So it comes as no surprise that artists and illustrators wanted to get these insider stories out, if for no other reason than to preserve their own sanity. To learn about the illustrative Poe, we turn to UVM English professor and Poe aficionado, Tony Magistrelli. He is currently working on a book looking at the great illustrators of Edgar Allan Poe. Good to have you haunting our set today. Oh, it's a wonder, wonderful to be back, Keith. <laughs> and what a great introduction oh. to Mr. Poe. Well, thank you. Uh, you must have had a good teacher. I must have had a good <laughs> teacher. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, give us a quick sketch of this book that you've been working on. It's um, it, it's big. Um, there are a lot, over 700 illustrators of Edgar Allan Poe, but I'm not going to be dealing with all of them. I'm going to try to look at probably the greatest of them, uh, in, at least in my estimation, mm -hmm. the greatest of them, or in some in some cases, a, a acknowledged greatest uh, illustrators of Poe. So it'll probably be a book of about 20, 25 illustrators. Um, that begin with the early work that was done at the end of the 19th century mm -hmm. and stretch all the way to films. Now this is not your first uh, rodeo with Poe. You've been teaching Poe for years. Uh, what has this shown you? What's different about this as opposed to studying Poe that you have for years? I, I think what I've learned more than anything is the way in which Poe can be interpreted in so many different ways. And the illustrators come at, the illustrators are artists after mm -hmm. all, so they come at Poe in a way that suggests a kind of aesthetic appreciation. Uh, they made me think about Poe visually. Hmm. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why they were initially attracted to Poe, because his, his work, his, his, his language is so visual. And you never had thought about, you know, obviously you read these stories and you try to imagine them. That had never, you were thinking more of the words and how all that works rather than thinking about the images perhaps? There's a lot of things happening when you read Poe. Mm. Um, the, the language stands out almost immediately. You know, you have to pay attention to the language. Right. But then you move into other realms too. You, room, you move into the aesthetic realm, you move into the psychological realm. And all of these things are happening with multiple readings. Right. And I think what happens with, with these illustrators is that they're taking on another level in looking at Poe uh, visually, mm. you know? And, that, and that, uh, that has really transformed my way of thinking about Poe, too. All right, let's talk more pictures. Yeah, <laughs> You've yeah. brought some illustrations. Uh, first is by the French modernist painter, Edouard Manet. What are we seeing here? What is this? Uh, what are we looking at? It's the first image. The yes, this, this, well, these, this is uh, 1875. Manet is illustrating uh, with five prints, uh, five charcoal uh, pen, and, pen and ink drawings of, of the raven. And mm -hmm. this is the narrator uh, at his desk uh, uh, at midnight uh, being awakened by the sound of, of a bird clawing at his, at his window, at his door. Who was Edward Manet? Manet was one of the great symbolist painters of the late 19th century in France, um, and he was drawn to Poe primarily because of his friendship with a fellow by the name of Malamé. Mm. And Malamé translated Poe. He was one of the first great translators of Poe from English into French, mm. um, and, and they, he was close friends with Manet, and Manet discovered Poe through Ma these translations. And not to undersell Manet, he sort of kicks off the, in any French uh, paint, painter you ever heard of, they all follow in Manet's wake. He's the one that sort of kicks it all off. Well, he's, he's truly very important. Right. And, and what he does, I think, more than anything is to bring uh, a real sense of the urbanity mm. of his time. He was right. really one of the great painters to look at men and women in terms of all of their urban finery and in terms of all their urban activities. And regular people too, not just Very kings and queens people. and generals. And if you look at those, if, you, if we could go back to those, mm -hmm. those, those uh, images, those yep. images yep. again, uh, one of the things you notice immediately, not so much there perhaps, but on the next one, uh, is, the, is the way in which there's an urbanscape. Right, it's a city. Right, yeah. right behind the narrator and who's letting the, 
uh, letting the bird in, right. and that urban scape is not there in the poem. <laughs> right, so right, this right. is this is Manet applying yeah. what what would be called the flaneur, uh, mm -hmm. this this figure of this urban gentleman, almost an aristocrat, and a, almost an aristocrat, yeah, yeah. but but very bourgeois, very middle very, class, very, okay. who takes on some of the characteristics of of the aristocrat. There's another image here. Uh, Many, not the only superstar artist, Gustav Doré. He's probably a well. He's a well-known printmaker. You've probably seen his illustrations. He did Don Quixote, The Inferno, and The Bible. Those are those are sort of his calling cards. And he illustrates Poe a little bit differently. Yeah. Tell, talk to me about how Doré does things. Well, Doré Doré's more rococo, more elaborate right. in terms of the way in which he looks at Poe. This is the. That, that what you see on this print here is the narrator uh, it, visualizing um, his dead Lenore, his dead uh, his dead uh, lover, right. uh, on her gravestone. Right. So it's uh, you know in some ways very very romantic, but also extremely florid in its in its approach to things. You can, flowers are everywhere in his work. And this illustration is not from the poem, but is something yeah. that Doré, as you said, came up with after sort of being inspired. Uh, that's right. That's right. And again, that that quality, that ethereal quality here, mm -hmm. uh, points the way really to the surrealist. Points the way to the late romantics. You know, with the, this image of of, of uh, this kind of ghost figure carrying Lenore off to, right. uh, and, and behind them, if you look at that carefully, is the house that, that, right. they're, that they're haunting. Right. And, and this is sort of gets back, this is like the earliest uh, uh, discussions of what's better, the book or the movie, because that's an adaptation, that image is not there. Right. Dore was inspired from what he was seeing. And nor, nor was the urban scape. Nor was the urban Manet. scape, that's right. So that's, that's one of the joys of discovering yeah. uh, these illustrations and talking about them. It's not that I'm, I'm not the first person to do this, right. but what I'm noticing are things that people perhaps didn't. Right. Uh, the fact that these, are, these, are, these illustrators are reading Poe through a very distinct lens, right. their own. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got an image here, uh, a few minutes left, we've got an image here of the black cat, and I think we both said uh, this is just an amazing image. What do you like about this? What stands out? Well, you know, again, uh, it's, it's this movement, it's this movement uh, on the part of the illustrators from talking about the poetry to the short stories, and here is one of Poe's most famous short stories, The Black Cat, and it's this figure of a man who is completely unhinged. Um, <laughs> you can uh, say. He suffer, he's suffering from mental illness, but he's also suffering from addiction to alcoholism. And his, his rage is, uh, is taken out on this black cat that you see up there in the upper right corner. But the entire landscape is meant to mirror his rage, right. the sense of the, the, the painting itself being slanted, the color contrast, and of course that open O that is the hat. That's right. That's right. And also, we should tell people if you have not read The Black Cat, no cats were harmed in this yes. story, but you'll have to find out for That's yourself. Right. In fact, Poe was a great lover of That's cats. That's right. That's right. He did. He, he, he did had like a, cats. He had a, his favorite cat called Katarina. Katarina. <laughs> <laughs> it's good Poe like dad jokes. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, two more images, much more horrific, much more uh, in keeping with Edgar Allan Poe. This first one, Murders in the Rue Morgue. This is just a wonderful <sighs> illustration of how an artist can use depth and things like that. Uh, framing, it's, it's incredible. This is, uh, this is by an Italian uh, illustrator by the name of Alberto Martini, who has an entire Pinocoteca, uh, <laughs> a, a collection in Northern Italy, uh, his, own, his own museum. And this is one of the, the, one of the uh, drawings that's there. And if you look carefully at it, you're, it's, it's a wonderful image of per, of, on perspective. Right. I mean, you're looking through the legs of the orangutan, who is the person who is res uh, the thing that's responsible for murdering um, Madame Espagne and her, her daughter, and and that's the daughter that I, that I think you're seeing right, right there between his legs. Spoiler, spoiler alert for a story that's a uh, hundred and some years old. But, yeah, if you uh, haven't read this by now, you right. need to read it immediately. <laughs> immediately, <laughs> it's another great image of uh, from Beecher of the Pit in the Pendulum. Now this is this is horror skeletons. This is good stuff right here. Yeah, that's that's really a great one too. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think the thing that I like the most about it is that there are those figures behind him. I don't know how well you can see them oh, in this yeah. print, but there are those figures that are painted on the wall behind him. And the question becomes, are those figures that are anticipating his death, or are those figures that are actually inside his head? 
or is celebrating what's happening. <laughs> what's happening? Too. Well, it is. It is Halloween. It is Halloween all. out there. Yeah, all. That's, that's right. right. Um, two more illustrations. Uh, Edmund Dulac, uh, the bells. Now. When you sent these to me, I sort of looked at them and I thought, the bells, that's that charming little poem that everything sort of tintinabulation, everything right. rhymes. Uh, not, not so much. <laughs> well, yeah, but you're, you're right. In the first half of the poem, sure, it's a lovely sure. poem about, about uh, youth and about wedding bells. wedding bells and about Christmas. And then it goes dark right. because what happens is eventually the bells become a kind of symbol for for uh, experience right. moving out of innocence and into experience and this this gnome this this well a better word is altrum which is the okay. which is the german for nightmare okay and that's an alt right that's, there that's that you're alt. looking at that right. figure that is a kind of a uh, monster pulling the bells, and then we get to the end, and this is this is the the alarm bells. That These are the alarm the bells. End. There's a fire that's going on down below beneath that cathedral, and the smoke is coming up. And these are the voices that you're hearing of people, you know, who are suffering. I mean, people in California maybe <laughs> should watch this. <laughs> this sympathy here. Sympathy, sympathy <laughs> for a time. Uh, to quote Bell, the bells, what a horror they outpour. What a horror. What a horror they are poor. Well, you are not a horror at all. <laughs> I always enjoy uh, speaking to you. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. Really appreciate you my, coming out. My pleasure, Keith. Thanks for having me. I want to thank everyone here at WCAX for making this program possible. And as always, thank you for stopping by Across the Fence. Uh -huh.